Good morning and welcome to Winslow Christian Fellowship. My name is Colin Knights and I'm the pastor. Welcome to our morning service here at the public hall. Um, we, we were experimenting with being here and so we're trying out different things and seeing what it's like, what it's like on a cold winter morning with the heating on. Uh, the heating is just automatically gone off here, which is which is fine for now, but at some point we might decide we want it on. Now what happens to me or any underneath this burner to the back row? You know how the back row fills up first. The back row is the ones who are going to cook. You're underneath that row. So feel free to uh, follow Mike and Alex's example and move the chairs back if you feel yourself uh, getting too hot at any point. Um, Mike knows how to turn the heat um, the toilets you will find, ladies' toilets, are in the reception area, the entrance lobby area. The gents' toilets are through that door just there. Um, <coughs> we need to go. Um, I think that's something we need to know. The fire alarm goes off when we can't really go out. Um, So, I'm going to read a psalm about uh, the city of God, Zion, which is, in today's terms, Zion, the city of God, is the church. It's us. It's God's people. Psalm 87. He has set his foundation on the holy mountain. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are said of you, O city of God. I will recall Rahab and Babylon among others who acknowledge you. Philistia too, and Tyre along with Cush, and will say, This one was born in Zion. Indeed, of Zion, if we say, said, This one and that one were born in her, and the most high himself will establish it. The Lord will write in the register of the peoples, This one was born in Zion. As they make music, they will sing. All my fountains are in you. It's, uh, it's about how the people of God are glorious. Glorious things are said of you, O city of God. The church is glorious. It doesn't always feel glorious. It feels, um, we don't always feel that we are glorious. We feel like we're struggling from one day to the next. But the people of God are glorious. They will sing and will make music. We're going to sing, we're going to sing uh, Our God Saves and then chorus that. We've got one of our live musicians, I'm afraid, we're hoping to, but we um, might still cover him when he's in this. So he's not quite up to it. So uh, we're using recording songs today. So uh, if you'd like to stand, I'm going to sing together our God Saves. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, 
that's good. That's good for you reason. If you don't, you think, oh, I've got a bit, not, not a bad problem, but then you think, actually, this is, looks like it could be a hospital setting, helping others to help others. Who would help the man with a broken leg dropping his crutches? Oh, we've got quite a few people here. Yeah, anyone want to say why you would go for the man with the crutches? So good. If he fell down, he'd break another one. You don't want that to happen. You can have them at this point as well. Sorry, they did the crutches. And everybody else would trip over the man with a broken leg. Quite. Deal with him quickly, kill with other people afterwards. That's good logic, so there's some good reasoning there. Baby, anybody baby? You would help the baby first. Parents over there with a young child who would help the baby. Emily, you would help the baby first. Oh, so awesome. Just so, yeah, yeah, watch out for any accusation. For me, here, Emily, why would you help the baby first? I would help the baby. Carrying the baby might help anybody else, very good. The baby could be sort of dealt with. Anybody else, why would you help the baby? Why would you help the baby? It would be the noisiest. That's right, the noise of the baby just makes everybody anxious, everybody frustrated, and everybody stressed. Um, who would help the blind woman trying to find her way? Catherine, Julia? She's in her way, but the look of it. Jesus and his disciples. As he went along, he saw a man 
blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? But he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent him. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's arms. Go, he told him, wash it the pool of Siloam. This word being sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing him. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Is this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him, but he himself insisted, I am the man. How then will your eyes open? He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it in my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and Silo the wash. So I went and washed him, and then I could see him. Where is this man? I asked. I don't know, he said. <coughs> So what can we learn about this and about these judgments that we can make about people and about their deservedness or what they've done to deserve what they're suffering and how much they need help? Well, we're asking what Jesus, questions Jesus asked, and today we're actually looking at a question that the disciples asked, who sinned? Who sinned? <coughs> this man is blind. And the first thing we learn is that when we judge, God doesn't judge. When we judge, God doesn't judge. They met this blind man, and the disciples were trying to figure out this difficult question. The disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, he's blind, therefore, Somebody must have done something bad to deserve this. Did he do it himself? But the problem is, if he was born blind, maybe it was his parents and it was punishment for the something that they did wrong. They sinned. Jesus did not ask this question. This wasn't a question that the disciples asked. Who sinned? And it's a question that comes up all the time, because whether we realise it or not, sometimes we make these kinds of judgments without even realising it. And isn't it amazing that people can be more judgmental than Jesus? We are judgment creatures. We love to look at people and make big judgments about them. We judge them based on what they look like, we judge them based on how they behave. We even judge them based on what kind of music they might listen to. But what kind of a monster would judge somebody who's in the middle of suffering and say, well, what did they do wrong to deserve that? For example, there might be two people who have lost a leg. One of them is two people, right, two people in front of you and they've both lost a leg and you think they're the same. And then you realise that one of them is a soldier who sacrificed himself, his, his leg, when he went out there to protect people. And he lost his leg in the field of duty and you think that was an incredibly brave thing to do. And he's lost his leg in an act of sacrifice, in an act of bravery. And then this other person has lost his leg because he had diabetes. Sometimes diabetes can be that bad, but you can end up losing a leg. And if this person's got diabetes and he's eaten too many things that are bad for you, and he lost his leg, you know, you think to yourself, well, that guy with the diet, he deserved it, didn't he? But the guy with the, who was a soldier, obviously he didn't deserve it. So we make these judgments, don't we, about people. We look at them and they're, they're suffering. Suffer them <coughs> some kind of problem in life. 
So it's human nature that whenever we come across somebody who is suffering in any way, whether it's because of illness or injury or even lack of money or a lack of friends, we judge them. When you're in the situation you are because you did this. That affects how sorry my life feel towards them. That affects whether we feel compassion towards them. Because we are creatures who judge. Like the uh, judge elephant. Shouldn't we feel compassion towards people who are suffering? Even if it's their own fault in some way. Even if it's their own bad decisions that made them suffer. It's really hard to be compassionate towards people who suffer because of their own bad decisions that caused them to be that way. And the disciples, they see this blind man and they want to know whose fault is it? Who should we blame? Because we want to know whether to feel sorry for him or not. Well, we can thank God because he doesn't view us like that. God sees that we are slaves to sin and destined for destruction and it is every bit our own fault. We don't deserve one bit of compassion or mercy, but God <laughs> is compassionate anyway. Jesus loves us anyway. It's in his nature to show love to the unlovely, to help the unworthy. Now as it happens, there really is no way to blame this man for his own condition. It just doesn't make sense, it's not logical. He was born blind, so unless you believe that God was punishing him for something he would do in the future, but God doesn't work like that way ever. <coughs> really, if you're going to blame anybody, it does sound like it's his mind short, but I don't think even Jesus would agree with that, would he? We rely on the love of Jesus, that is very wonderful, because he doesn't blame those who, well, he does pray, but he's forgiving those who deserve Deserve judgment and delay. So let's uh, see. Jesus' love is very wonderful. The stand that sees it.
What's that a picture of? Can you see what it's a picture of? Yeah. Probably not. Okay. We do think it's a man who is 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 a man we we'll probably need to see more of the picture. Let's see a different part of the picture. Go over to it. So what's that a picture of? Stars. Stars, says A galaxy. God created the world perfect. 
Now why is it not perfect now? Well, because the man and the woman got out and leave that God chose, they said no to God. And as a result, we now live in a world of sin and death and <coughs> pain and illness. They rejected God, and that's why we live in a world of suffering. So essentially, this is the, this is the you, you get annoyed with cancel culture, the way people get cancelled, celebrities get cancelled. Cancel culture started right there with Adam and Eve, cancelling God from their lives, saying, we don't want you telling us what to do. And the uh, problem is that that means that God said, well, you're in our garden of Eden. From that point on, the world was a place of suffering place where death and illness were a reality. But God didn't leave us there. He set in motion a plan to rescue us, a plan to send a saviour who would reverse what happened, restore us to the blessing of the <coughs> inner world under God. When Jesus came, what he started to do, what he started to show us was what the world would be like when we get to heaven, when God has restored us to the situation that it should be. He performs miracles to demonstrate his ability to put the world back the way it should be. He came across a blind man. He can make the blind man see. That's saying, look, I'm the one who has the power to restore what should be. That's why miracles are called signs. There was a, there, this was the first sign that Jesus did, is the way John talks about it. He did the sign when he performs miracles. It's pointing to something else. To the future. Reversing the work, that, the thing that Adam and Eve had set off. Whose fault is it, therefore, we live in a world of death, illness, and suffering? Well, it's all of us. Because we all do what Adam and Eve did. We all perpetuate it. Say no to God, keep on being outside of life. And as a result, we live in a world where some people are blind, some people are ill, some people die young. The, the answer to the disciples' question, who sinned? Jesus could answer it by saying, well, Adam sinned, and so created a world in which some children are born blind, but now I have come to put things right. But rather than saying that, Jesus said, this is about the glory of God. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. God might be glorified <coughs> in this man who is blind. So that's really good to know. But where does it put, leave this man who's uh, in this world that Adam made, this world of sin that we could Along with Adam, a world of sin and suffering. Well, where is this man left? At the moment he's still blind, but that's not where he's going to stay. So we're going to sing now. We're going to sing, I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to trust in Jesus. Stand and sing.
So we're going to um, we're going to pray before we carry on. I'm going to pray for uh, um, those amongst us who are suffering. We're going to pray for Anna, the husband. I'm not sure how she's doing, how he's doing. But we um, heard this morning that he's um, not doing brilliantly. So we're going to pray for Anna and for his, uh, his, his lungs. Uh, <coughs> also for Helen recovering from the surgery. How's she doing this morning? Yeah, she's, she's doing well. She's doing well. She's still sore, no doubt. Um, we need to rest up. But, uh, thankful for the surgery she's been able to have and um, pray for her. And uh, of course, we want to rem remember those who are caught up in the fighting in Gaza. So um, let's pray. Father God in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you love us. And even though sometimes we are in situations where we struggle to feel your love or to even believe your love, we can ultimately look to the cross and know you love us. And you sent your son to die for us and to make the world right. We thank you that Alan is... Um, has had amazing hospital care and surgery in the past and we do pray for him now. We will help him as he fights this infection. We pray that you will, uh, well, for a start, we pray more for peace. We pray that he will be at peace and that Jews also will be at peace. That you would uh, lift, lift them up to you and pray that in whatever the situation is right now, we pray that they will know you are God and that you are with them hold them close, but we do ask for his rest restoration, we ask for his recovery, we ask for healing, we know that it can happen. Lord, we know that it's in your hands, and we trust Alan to you. Pray in your goodness, you will be with him now. We pray for Helen, thank you that she has had this really important surgery um, much earlier than she expected and we do pray that you would help her in her recovery to become stronger pray that she'll be rested well rested and that she would um, be able to get back to uh, fight and fitness soon so we lift her up to you and pray that you'll be with her this morning and uh, in the days of her recovery and we pray for um, Lord we do lift up to the people of ours and the people in uh, on, uh, well, we pray for the leaders of the both sides of that conflict that you would give them great wisdom and compassion and, with them, and give them insight to be able to see the best way forward, to be able to find peace amongst this fighting. But we pray for those who are caught up, that you would be amongst them, uh, that those who are uh, fighting for their lives would be able to turn to you, Lord, even in that situation that you would be glorified. Lord, we pray for your workers, your people who are in amongst those that are suffering to show your compassion. And we pray that it would be your compassion that people start to see at work in this situation which many have described as hell. We pray that your name would be glorified. We pray that there would be peace in that region, Lord, the, uh, it would be an unbelievable thing. Um, it would be a miracle for us to see peace <coughs> in the Middle East. And so we lift it up to you and ask for your hand of compassion and healing to be on that situation. In Jesus' name, we ask. Amen. Amen. So when we judge, God doesn't judge. The disciples said, who sinned? Somebody's to blame, surely. God said, don't, don't look to blame people just because something's wrong. We live in a world of sin. Um, which is that when God judges, we can't judge because he understands sin better than we do. And when God heals, God is glorified. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened with the works. God might be displayed in him. 
Arthur saying as he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sick. So the man went and washed and came home to see. It's easy as that for Jesus. He can just do it like that. Jesus shuts down the disciples, all that arguing about whose fault is it. It's not about punishing somebody's sins. He is blind so that there can be glory <coughs> through him. The man is being is blind so that he can be healed, so that people can see that Jesus is the healer, the miracle maker, the son of God on earth, the one who came to bring restoration, to put us back where we should be. Is it true of all suffering that Jesus comes and heals? Well, no, because some people get ill, go into hospital, and they never come out again. Do all occurrences of illness exist just so God can heal them? Well, obviously not, because some people don't get better. But the works of God can be displayed in somebody who is never healed. Because what is more powerful, is a miraculous healing more powerful, or is somebody miraculously coping with an illness? It might not be as spectacular to see somebody coping with a terrible illness. Healing is definitely the headline grabber. But healings actually are dismissed by those who don't believe. They're not going to believe in healings. There are faith healers that do amazing things, and I don't know, some of them may be not genuine, but there seem to be stories of faith healings that this day and age are genuine. But that doesn't mean that people are believing. They say it's a trick of some kind. But a person who faces cancer with a sense of peace, or a person who loses a loved one but still thinks about the needs of others in their grief, child that gets bullied but is still kind to other children, even to their own bully, might be less of a headline grabber, but it is incredibly powerful to the people that see that kind of miracle in action, being lived out through the lives of people they know. And it is much more difficult for the unbeliever to deny and dismiss when they see a person doing something that they believe to be just a miracle. How do you behave so positively in the face of such suffering? It's just as much a miracle when somebody suffers with God because they're showing that Jesus is in charge. They're saying, I know, I live in this, this world of sin and death and illness and suffering, but I believe that we are heading for this kind of world where Jesus is the king. And I'm going to trust in Jesus. I'm going to follow that king now in hope of the future that I'm heading towards. Where my suffering will be over. That's what gives me the hope. That's what gives me the peace. That's what gives me positivity where others will be crushed. If we trust in Jesus, then one day we will be healed. One day we will be healed because heaven is the place where we will be healed. We get back everything that was lost from the Garden of Eden. What made this man special, the blind man of Jesus here, what made other people special where their miracles performed, is that Jesus healed him before he got to heaven. He gave him an early taste of what we're all able to look forward to. Those who are you're dealing with the aches and the pains, you're dealing with the illnesses that you know are never going to be cured, you're dealing with that on a day-to-day basis, one day you will be free of that pain, of that suffering. Sometimes healings do happen miraculously, but most of the time I think we have to wait for heaven. Suffering is a result of sin, not, not of God's need for glory. He doesn't need us to glorify him. It's the result of sin. But one way or the other, when we are suffering, and you experience suffering, and I experience suffering, it can be an opportunity for us to glorify God. The hope he gives us, the peace he gives us.
and my ailments. God can help me cope with that illness and that pain because he is a God of compassion and because it glorifies his name when somebody endures illness full of hope. Am I struggling with failure, surrounded by people who have turned against me? God can be with me because he is a God of compassion, because he glorifies his name when one of his children endures rejection with grace or without bitterness or anger. Am I overwhelmed with the pressures and responsibilities of life? God can help me to cope because he is a God of compassion and because it glorifies his name when a weak Christian is stronger than everyone, anybody else knew, even they didn't know it, because it is God's strength. So obviously being shown through our weakness. So whenever we're facing a terrible situation and we look up and we shout, why me? At that point we need to believe that God may have chosen us to be the one who glorifies his name through adversity, through difficulty, through suffering. And remember, healing will come. Healing will come. When we finally get to be with Jesus in his home in heaven. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we do thank you for this healing, this man who was born into blindness and for the first time in his life was able to see. It's a miracle, it's an amazing thing. Lord, it's amazing to think that every single one of us can look forward to the day when we will see you as we should. Where our eyes will be fully open as never before. And when along with that we will know the healing of all the aches, the pains, the illnesses, whatever disabilities we might have, Lord, we will be restored. We look forward to that and we thank you for it. And we pray that you will plant that hope deep in our hearts. And through that hope, give us a strong sense of your presence with us and of the peace that comes through that hope. Lord God, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your power to use that goodness. And thank you for that faith and hope that you have given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> well, we're going to stand and finish by singing, Blessed be your name in the land full of the good things and the land full of the dark times as well. Let's uh, stand and sing. Blessed. <laughs>
stay around for refreshments. There's um, coffee and tea, and there's uh, cake made by Carol. Very grateful to Carol that she hasn't even come, but we've got this amazing looking chocolate cake. As well as a couple of other things. So, uh, anyway, I'm going to finish with uh, words from Romans 8.30. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory 